everybody. It is 7 p.m. in Paris. I would like to thank you all for joining this new Septodon webinar. So today, all the Septodon team is really pleased to welcome Dr. Barry Houghton, who will give us this conference. Thank you very much, doctor, for sharing your knowledge, your experience on how to improve every aspect of the patient experience. So we'll have about let's say 40 minutes presentation, followed by about 10 to 15 minutes question. Just so you know, all the microphones are mute, so please uh, use the chat to ask us the question and uh, Dr. Ulton will answer them at the end of the webinar. Also, please note that uh, this webinar is recorded, so you'll uh, receive the video within, uh, let's say, two days, uh, and it also will be available uh, on the YouTube channel. So many thanks. Dr. Ulton, for this lecture, stage you. is yours. Thanks, Elsa. I can see that people are still joining us, 45 at the moment. For those of you that are here, welcome, good evening. Uh, it's six o'clock in the UK, um, and I guess there's a number of people from different countries. So welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so Septodonts are used to putting on webinars that are predominantly clinically based. Um, they're fantastic materials, their needles, the biodentine, bioroot, all the stuff that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but we're, we're going out on a limb here a little bit because what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna talk to you less about the practicing of dentistry, but more about the journey of dentistry for patients and how you know, how we can really think about improving that right now, given what we've all gone through, including our patients, obviously, given what we've all gone through over the last 12 months and where we are at the moment, you know, there's an element of uncertainty of how, you know, are we still going to be in, you know, all this PPE? Um, and, and so I'm going to be touching on this because I think there are things that I can share with you that will make a massive impact the moment you go and practice it. And so let me just give you a little bit of background so you know why I'm stood here. Um, I am a dentist. Uh, I've been a dentist for 26, seven years, something like that. I've owned my own practices now for 21 years. And for the last 20 years, I've been based in a really lovely town in Surrey called Hazelmere. Um, now, it's, things happened in my personal life about 13 years ago that drove me to go and learn more about psychology, uh, about neuro-linguistic programming, hypnotherapy, and things like that. So I became a practitioner of NLP, a master practitioner of NLP. I became a master hypnotherapist, and then I became coach certified and qualified. And now what I do is I go around the country. I am a clinical dentist for three days a week. I cram in 28 hours of clinical dentistry. But the systems that I developed about 13 years ago, once I learned NLP, took my business from um, a quarter of a million to a million turnover. Uh, those are the things that I'm now out and sharing, some of which we'll touch upon today because it was about understanding language, understanding that not everybody, including our patients, processes information the way that we do. And when I learned NLP and I started to implement that in my life, it made a big change for me personally and professionally. A big change personally with the relationships that I had with the people that I loved, because I understood then that they process information differently as well. So that's, I'm kind of gonna be sharing some of that um, because I, I teach this on training courses and I can't download all of this in 40 minutes, but I'm gonna give you some nuggets that if you go away and implement, will begin to make a change. Because I think all of us have been affected by what's swimming around on the screen right now. It's, um, it's affected our personal lives, our professional lives. Personally, my practice was closed for four months. Uh, and now, thankfully, we are open, turning and burning. We're, honestly, we're so incredibly busy. That's wonderful. But we have some challenges because, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we would have conversations with our patients very much like this. You know, eye to eye, you know, very close up contact without any concern about this sort of thing. And I would do my treatment presentations or my TCO would do our treatment presentations like this. We would sit knee to knee, eye to eye in a small room, having a conversation, being able to talk about what the options are, 
what the diagnosis is and so on and so forth. And yet now this is a photograph of me. We find ourselves in this situation. When I spoke to Elsa originally and she, we, we started talking about ideas of what we could do to add value to Septodont customers and how we could potentially help. You know, she said that a lot of dentists are concerned about the situation. They're concerned about the effect on our communication with patients when you're wearing this. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have invested in this because the rest of the team are wearing stealth masks, which some of you watching will know makes communication even harder than wearing this hood uh, and looking like a spaceman. And then we've got teams of people approaching patients like this. And nobody really can work out who somebody is or, you know, it makes communication much harder. So I've got a question for you right now. In terms of COVID, in terms of your patient journey, where's your head at? How are you feeling about this whole situation? Because overwhelmingly, I think there is a concern. And, you know, I wonder, are you one of the people that genuinely sees this virus as a major problem and is concerned about the effect that it's having on your business, on your patients, on your ability to deliver dentistry? I've surveyed a lot of dentists during lockdown, in fact, because um, I do online training. And during that time, surveying dentists, they, they came up with a number of things that they were concerned about and the effects that COVID was having. And so if we just briefly look at the sort of things that people are saying, and you, you may resonate with some of these, you may see a couple of these and think it's the same, or you may hear me say something that you think, yeah, that makes sense. So it'd be interesting to see how you feel that a lot of people have said that they find it difficult to communicate in PPE. They've said that there are concerns about the increase of costs, whether that's an increase of cost to us as a business or whether we pass that on to the patient. There's therefore an a concern about how they explain that to the patient and how they explain those increase of costs in terms of the PPE. Some people have said that they have patients who are worried, um, that they have um, concerns for their staff and their staff are worried that there's decrease in patient appointments, particularly when it comes to considering fallow time and downtime, is that if you're operating and you have to create fallow time, there's a whole new, whole new nuance to how you're organizing your diary and how you're able to deliver the dentistry to your patients. So all of these are what we would determine and, and believe to be problems created, if you will, by the situation that's among us, which is COVID. And then, the compliance of the things that we all need to comply with and, and follow the rules. So I've got another question, which is, what do you think right now is the future of dentistry? Where do you sit in terms of your confidence and your feelings for how the beginning of 2021 is gonna be? Do you see dentistry globally as being a bit of a, it's a bit of a rotten, rotten tooth? You know, is the whole situation rotten? Or do you actually see that there's uh, a potential out there? Do you see it as rotten or rosy? For me, personally, I see nothing but rosiness. Mm -hmm. And I know we've got challenges and I'm gonna help you to how you can see things slightly differently. So what are we gonna cover for the next 40 minutes? Three, three areas I wanna talk to you about. The first is, I wanna share with you this thing called the model of communication developed by neuro-linguistic programming. In other words, it's really how we process information ourselves um, and that ultimately how it feeds to our behaviors and our decisions and therefore our results. And that will help empower you. The second thing is, I want you to think about the fact that what you focus on, you get. And we're gonna talk about mindset and how important it is. And we're gonna do a little exercise, sat where you're sat right now, wherever you are in the world, We'll do a little exercise that will um, make you understand what mindset is about and how we can be in control of it. And then thirdly, I am a firm believer that language weaves magic. Most of us don't realize that there are words that we use and phrases that we use that influence people on a subconscious level. And I swear down that when I learned this, my profit went up by a hundred thousand pounds a year 
because I learned some language skills that meant that I got out of my way when I was explaining treatment plans. And I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that later so that you can understand. Because when you change one word, it will have a massive impact. And that's the, if, if all you took away tonight was that, that will improve your relationships and it will improve your sales, your treatment acceptance, if you like. So let me start with this. You've got to bear with me because I'm going to throw a lot at you over the next 40 minutes. So go with the flow. Uh, and that book, Flow, was written by uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, a Hungarian philosopher and psychologist. Now, he postulated, this is a head on the left of your screen. And imagine that events occur. You know, a short scouser sits on your screen and communicates with you. Now, these events occur outside of us. And we are bombarded by information, okay? And the information comes at us, our, our data or information comes through our five senses. Now, unless you have an impairment, we all have these five senses. And that's our sight, our hearing, our taste, our smell, and our touch. In NLP, we call that VACOG, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. So imagine all this information is coming through to you through your five senses, okay? Now, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi postulated that we are bombarded, bombarded by information every second. He thought by two million bits of information per second. Recent neuroscience research has suggested it's over 20 million bits of information every single second through our five senses, through our hearing, through our sight, through our touch, through our smell and our taste. What they also believe is that we can only process consciously 134 bits of that information per second. So think about that for a second. 20 million pieces of information coming at us through our sense, our senses, and we're only consciously aware of 134 bits. So we have to somehow, without thinking about it, subconsciously, we have to somehow cut down the 20 million to 134. So how do we do that? There are three ways that our brains process and filter that information. The first thing our brain does is it deletes a load of it. Now, let me give you an example. Wherever you're sat, there's 57 of you, right? I want you to sit right now and look around your room. Look around wherever you are, and I want you to start to notice everything that is blue. So look around and just have a little look at everything that you can see that is blue. Perfect. OK, come back to me. Now, shout at me everything that is red. Ah, now that's actually quite hard, isn't it? Now look around the room, you'll see things that are red. The information was there. The red was being bombarded through your through visual and yet you deleted it because your focus was on blue. So that's what deletion means. We don't delete it as in it's not there. We just delete it from our conscious awareness. So it's still there. We're still bombarded. But from our conscious awareness, we remove it. That cuts it down. The next thing we do, and I could, by the way, I could spend a whole day just on this model. So I'm, I'm condensing it. The next thing we do is we distort. So we take information and our subconscious mind is quite lazy. And what it does, it wants to take the path of least resistance. So it can distort things. And I'll give you a prime example of distortion. I have a fantastic PA called Sally and her husband, Jeremy, is a driving instructor. And this one particular time, he was driving for a company called A-Star, and then he started his own company called L2P. I am driving my three-year-old down to nursery, down the hill to Hazelmere. I see Jeremy's car come towards me. I flash the lights. I'm waving through the windscreen. And as I pass, I go, oh, my God, that's not Jess. I had distorted the fact that that was an A-Star learning car and distorted the fact that it was Jeremy. You've all done this when you've waved at somebody and gone, oh, it's not them. Or you've distorted information where, have any of you ever got the wrong end of the stick? You understand that in the European countries, the wrong end of the stick is where you've kind of mixed up the information. Somebody said something to you and you've gone, yeah, whatever. And they've gone, whoa, I didn't mean that. You distorted the information. We all do this. The final thing that we do is that we generalize. We make things easy. This is how we learn. So we group things together. This is where isms come from, sexism, racism, all sorts of things come from where we generalize. 
I could expand a lot more to give you examples of this, but I want to move forward. So we take a lot of information through our senses, we condense it down to 134 bits, we delete, distort, and generalize. This is partly why all, how many of us are on here now? 54. So let's say there's 56 of us on right now. We could all witness uh, a motor accident and every single report would be different. And every single report would be different because we will have filtered out different bits of information. Make sense? We were all bombarded by exactly the same information, yet the reports would be different. So all of this information comes, we cut it down. The next thing that happens is this 134 bits, it all goes through our own internal, our unique filter system. Now, our filter system includes a lot of things like time and location. So time and location, if I told you a joke, what time is it now? Six o'clock. If I told you a joke right now in a bar, you would laugh your socks off. If I told you the same joke tomorrow morning at work, I could get the sack. So time and location will change whether information is appropriate or not. Even though it's the same information given in the same way, the time and the location can change it. If I phone you up at three o'clock in the morning and ask you for a euro or a pound, you're going to go, on you go. If I phone you in the afternoon and ask you for a euro or a pound, you'll go, are you okay, Barry? Same information, same person, same request, yet time and location changes the meaning of the information in our heads. So it's time and location. Our mood can change how we do this. So can things like meta programs. We teach meta programs on my training course, which is personality preferences, how people will decide whether they like to think globally or they're very specific things like that and then language and this is where i'm going to focus on a little later the language that we use to ourselves and to other people can have a huge impact on the outcome our behaviors our feelings and therefore our results and i'm going to touch upon this because i want to mention to you particularly because we're all going through covid i want to talk to you very briefly about how you use language in your own head to the language of your mind, not the language that you use verbally to anybody else. So I'm interested, would you like to know how you can change your reality just by changing your language? You can pretend to give me a thumbs up at the screen, okay? Because we're gonna do it. What I'd like you to do, I would like you now to consider something in your life, could be COVID, I'd like you to consider something in your life that you would label as a problem. Now, what I want you to do is think about that problem. Think about why it is a problem, how it's a problem, what sort of things does that generate for you? And then I want you to start to think about the words that you use to describe being in or having a problem. And typically the words that I get from people are frustrating, painful, upsetting, stuck, uh, fear, um, no options, controlled, worried, all of these things. And you, you'll notice that every word that I've used is very negative. So let's keep the same situation. And this time I want you to consider, just give your head a little shake. Let's just mix it up a little bit. I want you to think of the same situation that you thought of, only this time I want you to think of it as a challenge. What is it a challenge for? Who is it a challenge for? What does a challenge bring you? What does a challenge do for you? What are the words that you would use to describe having a challenge? And again, typically we get things like optimistic, you know, and we've got um, options. There are, it's exciting, it's more positive. And the words that people use to describe to me a challenge are far more positive than the previous situation. So shake again, give your head a little shake, clear the screen. The same situation, the exact same situation. I want you to consider the same situation now as an opportunity. What is it an opportunity for? Who is it an opportunity for? What's it like to have an opportunity? What's the change in your body in the way that you're feeling when you compare having an opportunity to a previous situation? And the words that come out are much more exciting. Doors are opening. I can see change. I feel optimistic. I feel happy. There's a whole different change. Now think about this for a second, my lovely people. 
we're talking about the same situation. And the only thing we've done is to change the language in our head of how we label it. If you label something as a problem, guess what? It is a problem. If you label something as an opportunity, your world opens up and you start to see different things that you can do. I genuinely, hand on heart, I chose to see COVID and the lockdown as an opportunity. And it has taken my income stratospheric because I generated online training. I've done more social media marketing. I've written more courses. I've got three more courses out. I took it as an opportunity rather than to be worried and feeling as a problem. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to catch yourself when you're thinking of something as a problem because your reality just changed. Whatever situation you thought of, your reality just changed, even though you're still sat exactly where you were. And the reality changed because you simply changed the language in your head. Now, I've got to say, if you take something from problem to opportunity, that's a big leap. So I want you, whilst you practice this, when you think you have a problem, I want you to sit down and go, right, how can I see this as a challenge? A challenge is something that we like to get over. A challenge is something that we are motivated to take on. And then how can I see this as an opportunity? What opportunities are out there? Take our example 10, 15 minutes ago, when people are describing to me what it's like to have COVID in, in, the, in, the, in the vicinity, you know, it's all these worries, all these problems. And yet, when we start to take COVID and see it as a challenge, yes, and then, oh, maybe even an opportunity, what could it be an opportunity for? Well, for me, these are changing into what the opportunities are around COVID. I want to encourage you watching this, whether you're watching this live or recorded, I want you to think about the fact that, yeah, PPE in an AGP makes communication harder. So why don't we float above our practice mentally and take a whole holistic view about our patient journey? Let's focus on the whole patient journey. Let's focus on every single touch point we have with patients from our marketing to our follow-up care, questionnaires, love, TLC calls, asking for referrals, asking for Google reviews, asking for compliments, all of these things. And let's spend the next few months focusing on every touch point apart from the AGP. And let's improve them. Let's learn communication skills, how to communicate more clearly, how to grow our business. Let's use world-class language that influences people in a positive way. You can look at expanding your staff duties, expand their training. My, I don't take impressions, x-rays, scans, all sorts of things that my team do for me, but it encourages them and it makes their day-to-day -day work much more enjoyable. Let's look at how we're delivering dentistry. Let's learn to communicate with patients and talk to them about doing more dentistry, not just needs-based dentistry, but wants-based dentistry. Deliver the options for the whole mouth, not just the single tooth. And then let's consider teledentistry. What an opportunity that is to have conversations like this on Zoom or Teams or any other media so that you can share and have conversations with patients and add value to that patient journey. So I wanna encourage you all to see the opportunities that this current situation is presenting us with because when you nail every other touch point before and after that AGP, which makes communication difficult, when our excess AGP drifts away one day, what an incredible patient journey you have crafted and created. And you've already encouraged your patients then to be used to buying from you more advanced dentistry, more wants-based dentistry, not just needs-based dentistry. It's a huge opportunity. And I wanna encourage you to embrace this as that, rather than focusing on the effects of not being part. Because at the end of the day, that's who we're serving. We're serving our patient family. And we can serve them in a much deeper way when we look at all the other touch points. Most of us have been focused on the AGP. Most of us have been focused on our clinical dentistry, on the provision of what we're doing. And actually most patients, that's the least thing they're interested in. What they're interested in is how they're looked after from start to finish of their whole journey for the, for the 10, 15 years that they're with us. 
So I want you to begin to think about the things that you can action, the things that you can influence now. So back to this for a second, okay? Language changes the information. So do our memories, our decisions, all sorts of things, beliefs. I could spend a long time explaining and giving you really good insight into how you can influence this and influence others. But collectively, all of these things come together from the information we get, and it produces in our head what we call an internal representation of the world around you. That internal representation is either a picture, a sound, a movie, some self-talk, everybody's got a little voice, some of us have got two, or feelings, okay? And it's a mixture of those things. That internal representation that you have, that picture, that sound, that movie, that drives your emotional state, your state of mind. That state of mind also affects your internal representation. I used an example earlier on when I said, did you ever get the wrong end of the stick? That is an example where you had a bit of a poor emotional state, a bit grumpy, a bit of a bad day. Somebody says something to you and you go, yeah, whatever. And they go, whoa, sorry, Barry, I didn't mean that. My emotional state took the information and twisted it a bit. And that produced an internal representation of negativity, which then gave me an emotional state of anger or whatever. You can see what I mean. So it's an ongoing mix between these two. What's really key and the biggest influencer here, believe it or not, is your physiology, your body posture. I spend a lot of time talking to people about mental health issues and recommending certain things to go and watch and understand because our physiology determines our emotional state way more than the other way around. Now, these things interact with each other constantly every second, our physiology, our emotional state, what we're thinking. And ultimately, that is what drives our behavior. It's what we then go off and do. And it's our behaviors that ultimately gain as our results. Now, when I do any therapy work or any business coaching, Nobody wants to change behavior. What they want is they want to change the results. And we can do that by actually filtering back into any one of those things that I've listed from time, location, mood to values to identity. So I want you to think about internal language. Be positive. Be kind to yourself and think about your mindset. Now, I have to give you an example, right? Because for me, what you focus on grows. So let's let's talk for a second. I've got a friend. Now, I know I'm from Liverpool, and they're playing tonight, by the way. I know I'm from Liverpool, but I do have a friend. I have a friend called Kayla. She lives in the beautiful part of the world on the west coast of America in California. And one day, this is a true story, one day, Kayla was driving down the coastal road. She looked out to the sea, and she saw this beautiful sunset. She was so excited. She picked up the phone. She phoned her sister. She went, Julie, you've got to go outside and see this sunset. And Julie's like, "Wow." Oh, I'm watching Jerry Springer. He was like, Julie, go outside. Please see the sunset. So Julie's like, oh, OK. She's on the phone. She goes out. She opens the door. She looks at the sunset. She goes, Kayla, it's just a flipping sunset. Hang up, hangs up. Kayla's like, what? So Kayla got her phone out and she photographed it. She thought, I'm going to get home and show Michael, her husband. Drove home, super excited, burst through the door and said, Michael, oh my gosh, wait till you see the sunset. I photographed it. It's beautiful. Michael picks up a phone and goes, OK, calm down, love, calm down. Swipes left a couple of times and said, Kayla, it's just a flipping sunset. Kayla's like, what? At that moment, Kayla lifted up her sunglasses. What Kayla had been doing <laughs> was driving down the road with her rose tinted spectacles on. And whilst Kayla saw the most beautiful sunset, everybody else saw this. So people are going, it's just a normal sunset. And because Kayla had her glasses on, Kayla's like, oh my God, it's beautiful. Why do I share that story? Which is true. I share that story because this is like our mindset. Our mindset is like a pair of glasses that we put on at any part in the day. Imagine that I get up in the morning and the dog has weed on the floor. Do you think my mindset's going to be, oh my God, the dog's peed on the carpet again. What sort of mindset is that? It's very negative. I then bring that into work. Oh, the dog, oh, the dog. 
So your mindset is like a pair of glasses. And the only way I can explain this really well is to do a little exercise with me. If you're up for an exercise, shift in your seat, right? Take a nice deep breath in. And what I want you to do, I want you to pretend to put on a mindset pair of glasses, right? Only these are slightly damaged. They're scratched, they're broken. Put the mindset glasses on of the world is a dangerous place. Whew. The world is a dangerous place. Now, look around the room that you're in. Have a look around with the mindset of the world is a dangerous place. And I want you, I know I can't hear you, but let's pretend that I can. I want you to talk out loud of what you can see that fits in with the world is a dangerous place. So I've got electricity. I've got a computer here. I've got a light above my head that could fall down and hurt me. Uh, my garden's really dark. There could be a stranger. Strangers are dangerous. I've got uh, I've got a fridge that could explode at any minute. Oh, it's quite it's quite dangerous. So now you see everything that you're seeing in the world is a dangerous place. What I want you to do is take those glasses off, throw them away. Because what I want you to do is shake your face and put on a different pair. Only this time, ooh, these glasses are much cleaner. The world is full of beauty and love. The world is full of beauty and love. Now look around the same room. You have been bombarded by exactly the same information. Look around the room and shout out to me. What do you see with the mindset of the world is full of beauty and love? I see a picture of my children. I see a computer so I can connect with you wonderful people. I see my fridge, which has got milk in that I can make a coffee and I've got light and I've got heat panels and oh, the world is full of beauty and love. Now, can you see that if you live your life with the mindset of the world is a dangerous place, even though you've been bombarded by the same information, you filter through that mindset and you only see the world is a dangerous place. Now think about people you know, whether they're loved ones or patients or friends or family or whatever, you know people that think like this. And then think about somebody who goes around the world with the mindset, most of the time, of the world is full of beauty and love. And here is where they are both right. Whatever your mindset is, you focus on and it grows, and they're both right. And so my recommendation is, now that you become consciously aware of the fact that you can choose your mindset, I want you to consider changing that mindset and being very positive. You can even run an exercise. You can go to one minute mindset.co.uk. One minute mindset.co.uk. It's a free website where you can run an exercise for your team and come up with the team mindsets of how you're going to be and how you're going to act as a team and how you're going to treat your patients. Because, of course, you have 20 patients in the day, 19 of them are beautiful, amazing, and wonderful. It goes really well, and one is a pain in the bum. What do we focus on? Naturally, we'll focus on the one. But hey, wouldn't it be amazing to focus on the 19 and encourage one another and encourage our team members to do that as well? So when I talk to you about COVID and all of these worries and issues, that's a mindset. Problem, the life is a problem, it's a mindset. Life is an opportunity, is a mindset. And by the way, whatever you've got, you're right. If you focus on COVID and the whole situation being a problem, you're absolutely right and you will grow it and you will live it. And if you focus on this as an opportunity, things start to happen. And I, my friends, believe that we are at the right moment for us to absolutely take this opportunity to shine in our businesses, in our patient journey, in the way that we look after people. And so my advice is take a step back, start to look at your customer journey, look at every single point, sit down with your team, and look at how can we improve every single aspect, apart from the AGP for now, okay? Because that's what we spend 99.9% .9 of our time focusing on is what we're doing in the AGP. Let's broaden our horizons. Let's develop a wonderful patient journey where we have non-stop referrals, non-stop five-star reviews. That will massively impact the business. And then let's start looking after these people as a family, as our work family. You know, we're gonna learn new skills. We're going to learn to communicate online. We're going to learn to be able to have conversations with patients virtually. And this is no bad thing because actually, ultimately, this doesn't have to be 
the clinical dentist doing this. My TCO does this. That frees me up to be more clinical. That has an impact on the benefits to the business and also the profits as well. So I want you to be the one that stands out. Stand up and be counted. Consider all of these aspects that you can do. In addition to that, think about what you are using and utilizing that can make your life easier and make your patient's life easier. I have to bring reference to this beautiful suite of products that I use from these guys, whether it's from injection and local anesthesia, or whether it's from biodentine and bioroot. Biodentine I have in my upper left five and it's prevented an RCT. Phenomenal products. And also consider your techniques. This is a good time to develop your technique. Now I would give a picture of this because having been the founder of the comfortable dental injection technique, my patients are completely unaware that they've ever had an injection. I go so far as to say that almost entirely my patients are unaware when they've had teeth out. I can inject a child, four quadrant premolars taken out for orthodontic reasons. They have no idea they've had any of it done. It's sleight of hand, it's conversation and it's language, which I'm going to share with you in two minutes. So I want to encourage you to grow your skills that we learn as undergraduates. You know, I graduated 25 years ago. There's always room for improvement. Consider this dentalinjection.com. That's where you can learn that technique. It's an hour, super simple. Anybody can do it, but it tells you why it works and mostly what it is that you're doing that's already working and how you can just tweak it and make it even better. Simple changes can make a massive difference further down the road. So I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to find out where do you stand? Where do you rank in your customer service? Survey your customers, survey your patients, find out, and then start to look at where you can improve it. Because people don't really come to us just for dentistry. They come for it to us for the experience and the way that we look after them. Nobody wants a white smile. What they want is what they perceive a white smile will give them emotionally, a feeling of confidence or a feeling of acceptance or a removal of rejection. It's an emotional thing. And so focus a little bit more on the emotional journey of the patient and you're on to a winner, as well as focusing on great products, great techniques. So language skills, I have but a few minutes and I really wanna share a couple with you because in my map of the world, when I learned this for me, language really does weave magic that's how we hypnotize people it's language and being in rapport and we can hypnotize people to not need local anesthetic now i'm not saying do this it takes a long time i don't want to do it if you're interested actually you could go to youtube and bbc scotland videoed a friend of mine in scotland who hypnotized the lady and the surgeon took out two central incisors bone grafted two implants no local anesthetic now, if that floats your boat, I can teach you how to hypnotize. But to be honest, I want to use great local anesthetic in a way that patients are not aware I've used it with language skills that allow me to get on with the job in like four minutes, not take an hour to hypnotize and consistently have to be working on it. It can be done, but it's, it doesn't float my boat. So here's some bits to learn. Subconscious influence principles. The first rule of subconscious influence is that your subconscious mind cannot process a negative. Your subconscious mind cannot process a negative. Let me give you an example. If I say to you, don't think of a blue tree, you have to think of a blue tree, even for a nanosecond. You go blue tree, a pink elephant or green tree or whatever. So when we say to people, don't do this or don't do that, they have to think of doing that in order to not think of doing it. Does that make sense? Do you get that? So let me give you another example. When my girls were younger, let's say Millie was about uh, eight years old, I would have a conversation with her and say, Millie, don't spill that drink. Now back to this model, okay? Information comes into her, don't spill that drink. She has to form an internal representation of spilling the drink. That is a picture, a sound, a movie, in other words, what I did when I said, Millie, don't spill that drink, baby, I caused her to rehearse spilling it. Does that make sense? And so I, would, I had a positive intent. I knew that I wanted the liquid to stay in the glass and not end up on the carpet. Millie, sweetheart, don't spill that drink. She processes that and invariably what happened? It increased the likelihood that she would spill the drink. 
and then I would chastise her. I told you not to spill it. Well, that's my bad. Because a few years later, when I went, when I learned all of this, I realized I'd actually told her to spill it. That makes sense. So another example is I have a friend who's a catwalk model and she would walk along the catwalk in a certain length of dress, certain high heels going, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip, playing it in her head, playing herself falling over. And invariably what happened, she fell over. When we changed the language in her head, she never fell over again because she focused on what she wanted. It's like a mindset, focus, whatever you focus on, you get and it grows. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. So let's think of us in our profession. We all have very positive intent for our patients. We want the best for our patients. You'd agree with that, right? And so we want to reassure them. And whether it's us as clinicians or our team members or even our front of house, they say things to patients to encourage them, to look after them. They say things like, oh, little Johnny, don't worry. Well, hang on a minute. Little Johnny's never been to the dentist before. He's four years old. And he worries about ghosts and ghoulies under his bed. And so when we go, don't worry, little Johnny goes, <gasps> what? You mean there's something to worry about? No, little Johnny, there's nothing to worry about. We're not in control of where he goes to think about worry. Equally, we say encouraging things like, it's okay, don't be scared. Oh, you know, this, don't be nervous. Well, we're creating, think about this. Don't be scared. Why should I be? Don't be nervous. You mean I should be nervous? You've witnessed this. And my friends, you've also had this done to yourselves where somebody said something. You've gone, really? What? And they go, no, 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 no. There's nothing to worry about. You know, don't worry. It won't hurt. There won't be any pain. Now, imagine little Johnny, four years old, never been before. You've been here as a clinician or a chairside assistant. Mummy comes in with little Johnny and says, it's all right, doctor. I've told little Johnny not to worry. There won't be any pain and it's not going to hurt. And you went, oh, you didn't, did you? Now, you didn't say that, but you felt it because you already know this. So what do we do? It's really simple. You get together as a team and you identify what it is that you're saying to help patients that may be hindering you and them. You want to look at your negatives and turn them into positives. And I'll give you just three examples that you can take away, but I want you to run a team meeting. Grab pizza, have lunch, sit down and talk about this and then support each other as a team to eradicate your negatives, to come up with a positive that creates a positive internal representation that supports you and your team and your patient. Now, these are some of the things that we say in our dental practice and we've eradicated it. We have nothing but positivity, positive intent, positivity, positive words, positive statements. It's massively increased our success. And the last one, because then I'll take questions. This is the one thing that really made a massive difference to my financial success and my relationship success. And that was one word that I was using all day, every day without thinking about it, that I didn't realize that was impacting relationships, profit, or everything, and even my own personal motivation and determination. So this one word that changes everything, it's only got three letters, and it's a simple word of but. You see, on a subconscious level, and you actually already know this, on a subconscious level, the word but negates everything that came before it. And it focuses your subconscious mind on everything that comes after it. You know, it's been lovely speaking to you guys, but it's time for me to go to dinner. You would remember it's time for me to go to dinner. You would not remember the compliment of it's been lovely speaking to you guys. Another example is when we're talking about treatment to a patient, the crown is definitely the best option for that tooth, but a filling, it's a cheaper option. Guess what every patient chose in my former life? Pre-NLP, every patient chose to have a tooth filled, even though 40% of the tooth was missing. There were multiple fractures. I know that an indirect restoration without a shadow of a doubt was the best for the longevity of the tooth. And yet I was putting them off. I would tell a patient, you could crown it, but you could fill it and it's cheaper. Every patient went, yeah, okay, I'll do that. They followed my advice. Now, interestingly, back to mindset. I had a mindset back in the day 
where patients won't buy from me. Patients won't pay £850 for a crown. Patients won't have private dentistry off me. And then I would present like this. And invariably, it would prove my mindset. What you focus on grows. So every time I go, I explained about a crown, I explained about a filling, they wanted a filling. Nobody wants a crown off me. Uh-uh. I was the problem, not the patient. Another example, you nurse well for me today, but the surgeries need to be stopped. My girls didn't feel that I complimented them until I changed it. Okay, you can fill that space with an implant, but you could choose a denture. I am subconsciously putting my patient off choosing an implant. Crazy, isn't it? And yet you already know this. So what do we do? You consider changing your butt and getting your butts out of here and using the word and, because when you use the word and, it gives equal weight to both sides of the sentence in the statement. And so the simple examples I gave before, you substitute for an and, and they consider both. The crown is the best choice and a filling is a cheaper option, you know? So I don't need to show you all of these. I wanna skip because I would like you to begin considering using your butt on purpose, flipping your butt. And I'll give you an example. When you flip your butt, you're going to focus the attention of the subconscious mind to the second section of the, se of the sentence. So if I'm in a process of explaining something to my patient and I say something like, you could fill a space with an implant, but you could choose a cheaper denture, flip that over. You could fill a space with a cheap denture, but an implant is a much better option. When I did this with crowns, You've broken your lower left six, Mr. Smith. I could fill that, which is cheaper, but the very best option is a crown. Boom. My crown sales went through the roof. My technician phoned me up and said, Barry, can I ask you, have you got a new dentist? And I was like, no. He went, oh my God, all the lab work. But yeah, I got out my own way. Simple change, massive, massive growth, massive change. I, I need permission to give this one, one like, let me give this one last thing. I'm really sorry. I told you I, I go on a bit. Right. Harvard University, 1972, a psychologist called Ellen Langer. She wanted to find out some of the effects of language on people's compliance, on doing things that we asked them to do. So back in the day, we, if we wanted to get a copy of something, we didn't have printers in 1972. I mean, I didn't even have trousers in 1972. And so you'd go and use a photocopying machine and the biggest company was called Xerox. And in the big companies in America, they would have one huge machine and they would queue up like this, waiting to do their copies. So Ellen Langer went, right, what we're gonna do, you're gonna go to the front of the queue and cut in. And this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna walk up and you're gonna say, excuse me, can I cut in line? And we'll see what happens. Well, us Brits, where I am, we love a queue but we hate people cutting in line. And so when somebody went up to the front of the queue and went, excuse me, can I cut in line? 60% of the people went, oh, go on then. So just over half said, yeah, all right. So then Ellen Langer thought, right, let's try another experiment. So they got a subject to go up to the front of the queue and they said, excuse me, may I cut in line because my boss is in a major rush. And they thought, right, we're gonna give them a really valid reason to cut in line. The acceptance went up to 94%. 94% of the respondents went, yeah, go on then, if you're in a rush. So Ellen Langer did one final thing. She thought, I'm gonna go up and give a, a reason that is just benign, pointless, like <clears throat> So she got the subject to go up and said, excuse me, can I cut in line? Because I need to make five copies. Well, everybody needs to make copies. So you would expect that to go down to 60%, right? Or even maybe less, and it did go down it went down to a tiny 93%. Well, why was that? Ellen Langer discovered that it wasn't the validity of the reason that people gave that produced compliance. It was the use of the word because. The word because as part of a request acts subconsciously to increase the compliance of the recipient of the conversation. Crazy, I know, but we're all wired this way. So let's think about a sales communication process with a patient 
about a low LF6 that's broken, and we want to increase the likelihood that they choose the very best option, because that way we're serving them. We can do that with our language. You could fill that gap with a bridge, but when you choose an implant for a tooth, you benefit from it being fixed and stronger and durable and longer lasting. So we've negated the bridge. We have brought into the forefront of their mind that an implant is a better option. Then we say, because an implant replaces the missing tooth without the need to prepare the teeth next door. That, my friends, is a language sales genius that when you employ it, will have a massive effect. So I have to draw to a close. I want you to consider this is I thank you to Septodont for for breaking out of just clinical and going a little bit out the way. Um, I hope you enjoyed the information I've given you. I want you to consider your mindset because what you focus on, you get more of. I want you to consider changing your mindset. Go to one minute mindset.co.uk, do a free exercise. I want you to think about your language. Think about the way that you're influencing people with negatives. State things in the positive. So now I have six-year-old Chester and he's holding a cup. And rather than say, Chester, don't spill that. I say, Chester, sweetheart, carry that really carefully with two hands. Chester thinks in his head, carrying carefully with two hands. Does that make sense? So with that, I'm very grateful for you spending your time with me. And if you're watching this recorded, thank you so much. Come visit. Come say hi, send me messages, and uh, I'm here to serve. So I'll see you again. Hi, Elsa. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barry. So as usual, sorry, the, the exposé was crystal clear. Yeah, we are a bit late, but that's that's all right. Um, to all of you listening, so now is the time for uh, where Barry can answer your questions. You can use uh, on the right uh, part of your screen, you can send me your questions. Some of you already used my email to send me questions, so that's all right as well. Um, Barry, I, I selected a couple of ones that I just received. Um, so first one, Th this expose was great. I'll try and wear my positive mindset glasses. Uh, as COVID is, is taking a lot of my mental space, I'm not sure I'd be able to focus on changing everything in my practice, which is the one key element you would advise me to change now. Okay. I would remove the word change, first of all. I want you not to change things. I want you to enhance and develop and grow. The favorite phrase that I use with any of my clients is, this is a pace, not a race. So I agree, pick one area and grow and develop that. And so I would suggest the area for now may well be treatment presentation or you know how you're sat or how you're doing it virtually. Learn to build rapport, make that patient feel incredibly comfortable and then utilize language skills to encourage the patient to choose the very best options because that way you're serving them. You know, the, the word sell comes from the Norwegian word selje, which means to serve. And I know that if my patient chooses the cheapest option, let's forget their financial position. But if they choose the cheapest, I probably haven't served them so well. If they choose the best, I know that I'm serving them. And we offer financial packages to allow them to make the best more affordable. So focus on your communication in your treatment presentation appointments whether that's live or virtual that's where i'd say start with that cool thank you uh i had another question which was i often have a stressed patient especially at this time of covid how would you reassure them okay so with stress patients um in, it's an ideal situation to have a conversation with them pre-agp uh, as part of the training, we teach people how to build rapport. And once you build rapport, you can actually do something called match, mirror, pace and lead. And you can lead somebody out of feeling stressful into feeling more relaxed. I'll give you a really simple way of doing this, which I want you to practice. And that is out of the surgery, non-AGP, masked up if possible. Just have a general chat. And Elsa, would you role play with me? Let's try it. I'll put you on the spot, haven't I? I'm really sorry. Yeah, you okay. are. I can say no, right? So <laughs> you, you can say no, but I'll be very sad and very stressed. Yeah, no, I won't. I won't. I'll be happy. Okay. Let's roll. Play. So let me ask you a question. In the last five years, 
Have you been on any holidays that were truly wonderful? What's the best holiday you've been on? Uganda. Where was it? Sorry? Uganda in Africa. Uganda. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell me, what was so good about Uganda? Um, discovering the wildlife there, because it's a mix of jungle and savanna. Okay, what was the best bit of wildlife that you saw? Tell me about it. Um, the best part was a gorilla trekking. Wow. How did you feel seeing the gorilla track? Well, very exciting and very unique. Brilliant. Brilliant. So can I just say, Elsa, thank you very much for sharing. Um, with your eyes, I could tell that you were visually recalling seeing the gorilla. I could tell that you were visually recalling things about Uganda. Am I right? Yes, you are. Yes. When I asked you, how do you feel about that? Your eyes went down and you connected with the excitement. Right now, if I asked you that in a room outside of my surgery and just chatted to you, I now have you in quite a positive state. Now is the point I'd say, Elsa, listen, that Uganda trip sounds amazing. I tell you what, when COVID's gone, oh, it's going to be great to do something like that. Today, my dear, I am going to make sure that I absolutely look after you. I'm going to make sure that you're completely comfortable, that you're in control, that we are taking care of everything and I want you to know that you can stop me at any time ask me any questions or just tell me if there's something that you're not feeling completely comfortable with tell me what it is and I'll make sure you're comfortable how does that sound Elsa is that okay so what I've done is I've very simply in 30 seconds taken you into a positive state and then I've linked what I'm going to do with positive language and reinforcement to your positive state you now feel much more relaxed about coming into the surgery with me or the studio, or whatever you call it. Trust me, it takes a little bit of practice, but my goodness, this stuff works. And if you're concerned, you go, oh my God, there's so much to learn. Did any of you ever get into the car for the first time you were driving and just nailed it? Or did you go, well, hang on a minute, I've got to do gears and, and what, oh, oh, look in mirrors. Everything that is new takes a little bit of getting used to. So be playful with it, practice, and it'll work. I think the demonstration was quite clear. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Thanks for playing along, Elsa. I appreciate your help. <laughs> so another question that we got was, um, could you please tell us more about your comfortable injection technique? Oh, absolutely. It is so easy. It's embarrassing. Um, it, for me, it has to include Ultra Safety Plus, and for me, it has to include Articane. I haven't done an ID block. Oh, hang on. I do, so I work a lot. You know, I do a lot of dentistry. I do a lot of comprehensive dentistry, very little single tooth because of the way that we talk to our patients and sell our dentistry. So it's mostly quadrant and I don't do any ID blocks. It's all uh, buccal and sometimes lingual infiltration and it's with Articane and my patients do not know that they've had the injection. Um, I could, I could do another talk on it. In fact, I am lucky enough to be invited to the symposium in Paris, which I can't wait for, where I'll share, because there are aspects of the whole you know, process, which by the way, that process takes, oh my God, how long does it take? 40 seconds, 40 seconds to the point at which the patient goes, what injection? Now I'll be honest, I haven't really given much of the anesthetic at that point, you, you need to, if you go to dentalinjection.com, the whole thing's there as a series of videos to teach you. But in essence, I use a topical anesthetic. I vibrate that, I move it to instigate the gate theory of pain. I then use distraction, top-down modification. So I'll say, oh, by the way, play along Elsa. Elsa, well, as you look at the camera, can you wiggle your little toes without wiggling your big toes? Right, everybody look, right? She's completely distracted <laughs> from me right now, right? Okay. I'm trying, but... At the moment you went, can I do that? By the way, yeah. the needle was in, you didn't feel a thing, okay? Next thing is, needle is, I have the bevel parallel to the mucosal surface, which is marked by the little Christmas tree on the Ultra Safety Plus, which most people go, oh, I didn't know that's what it was for, including me about five years ago. So parallel, just under the surface, three or four drops of local anesthetic, which begins to numb the surface. Okay, and then I go, Elsa, how was your injection? And you go, injection? What injection? I go, thank you very much. Aren't I amazing? 
you just had an injection, Elsa. Now you know that when I give an injection, it's completely comfortable. I'm going to do it again. Is that okay? And Elsa goes, yeah, that's fine. It was amazing. <laughs> then I'll go in slowly, progressively, drip, 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 a mill a minute. Patient is already relaxed, thinks I'm amazing. I, I tell you, I took my business from 250,000 to a million, no marketing, purely from this injection technique and word of mouth recommendation. I haven't marketed for 13 years. Patients go away going, oh, you need to go. You don't feel a thing. It's amazing. And honestly, I could teach my six-year-old to do this. Shimples. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let's grab maybe two more questions and then we have to, to finish this webinar. Uh, even if I know you could, you could <laughs> carry on for hours. <laughs> so, um, we had that question also. I fear I won't have enough time to discuss with my patient. How do you manage to find this time and how many patients per day can you see? Okay. So this is where the cards are on the table. I spent a good few years honing my business to the point. So I, I'm a master communicator. Uh, I am the go-to communication and sales guy in dentistry. But I don't really talk to patients and I don't really sell anything anymore because I've learned it and I teach it. I have other people doing that. And so the patient journey is not all about me anymore. And the way that we manage to be so financially successful and patient centered and centric and the patients be so happy is for us. It's a whole team approach. And so when a new patient comes in, it's a 45 minute appointment with my treatment coordinator. She's finding out certain things about the patient for me. She'll then hand over to me after 45 minutes of chat where the patient's like, God, no one's ever asked me things like this before. This is amazing. Then we do an incredibly comprehensive evaluation examination where I'm repeating back what I've been fed and told. By the way, my nurse is taking 21 photographs. They'll take any radiographs, they'll take any scans, they'll take any impressions for me whilst my TCO is handing over. I then go in, it's almost like, um, it's almost like a show, right? I, I hate to say that I'm the main actor and somebody's warmed them up. You know, I burst on the scene and go, ha ha, it's me. And they go, oh, hello you. And I go, I know all about you. Let me tell you a little bit. You've got a low enough six that's broken. They go, how did you know that? And I go, she told me. So we have this kind of thing. And so it's not all about me. It's really about the patient and it's about that whole patient journey, which is why I mentioned it earlier on. So my answer to you, whoever asked that question is number one, take more time until you can develop the system that I've developed or make it even better, because I'm sure you will, until you can develop that system, take more time personally to sit and talk to your patient. When you learn to explain comprehensive dentistry, that time will be the best time and will make you way more profit because you get away from being a tooth fixer, a firefighter, a single tooth dentist, a problem solver, and you become a preventative, cosmetic driven, it just works. So my answer is take more time. And I know that's counterintuitive when you're under pressure and you've got bills and you've got family to feed and everything else. But when you take more time, your money will increase because, see what I did there? See what I did now, so I used the word because, because that time will pay dividends. Then when you've honed it, you can teach somebody else to do it. So I am clinical and wet fingered as much as possible. I run two studios, I have two nurses and we don't run them at the same time. We run them staggered and it means I'm hugely productive, but the patient is still getting the love, the care, the attention, the right language, the right information as a team approach. Clear. I can teach you, but it's going to take a few days. <laughs> <laughs> I think we only have a few minutes, unfortunately. So I'm going to uh, ask you the very last question um, that we got here. Um, yes, the answer is I'm 28. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not I could that. That's not the question, was it, Elsa? <laughs> it's another one, actually. It's, um, do you think that training more young students uh, at the faculty on those subjects could in the future change the image that dentists have of dentists and calm their fear. 
So whoever asked that question, I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> um, I believe that my injection technique will ultimately change dentistry in a couple of generations. I want it on the undergraduate training of every university, because if we can train young dentists to give completely comfortable dental injections, what a difference that is going to make globally. In a couple of generations time, patients are going to be, yeah, I had all my teeth done because it's easy, right? The two biggest worries of patients are number one, the injection and number two, the pain. So if we eradicate those two, my goodness me, what a difference it makes. I have to say, I went to a massive bank and pitched the fact that I have a whole business plan of taking all of this communication training, not just the injection technique. I wanted to take all of the communications training that I offer to postgraduates. I want to take it into undergraduates. And we have problems with the universities not wanting that kind of stuff in. So we were going to do it privately and then COVID hit. So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that at some point, perhaps next year or the year after, we can create a program for undergraduates that will be funded by somebody that then holds their hand for the next 20 years, for goodness sake. Um, and we can teach them the, all of these communication skills because my goodness, they work. So whoever asked that, if you're up for it, give me a shout. <laughs> okay, message, message is clear. Uh, thank you so much, Barry, for this amazing presentation. Uh, I think awesome. it was Thanks really interesting me. and super and dynamic. Thanks for being my guinea pig. I appreciate putting you on the spot. <laughs> thank uh, you so I, much. I guess you did it because I look like a gorilla. What can I say? <laughs> a 20-year-old one. <laughs> <laughs> 28, absolutely. Thank you. 28, right. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Lovely. Thanks Barry. for having me, Elsa. Appreciate it. And thank you all for attending. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much.